if it already shared. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it um, clear. All right. Uh, okay, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be invited to this ecology webinar. It's, this is gonna be my first time presenting my research at the University of California. And um, yeah, thank you for my friends who also uh, managed to attend this event at this uh, very late hours. So yeah, uh, we'll begin this presentation, but first of all, I'd like to introduce my organization first. Uh, I work for the Johanna Foundation. This is an environmental uh, nonprofit organization uh, that focuses on advocating land use and sustainable cultivation of chopped up timber lands to support food security. So, uh, Suboptimal lands here means uh, generally uh, it's the types of soil that is too wet or too that is too wet or too dry. And uh, sometimes it's also uh, known for uh, let's say peat land, dry lands, arid lands, or swamp lands. And that's why we also focus on uh, wetlands in the coastal lands to, uh, to help the coastal communities uh, uh, cultivate their lands into productive lands. And in this area, it, it also covers the mangrove area as well. And that's why we work with another NGO, uh, namely Blue Forest. Uh, their focus are their focus is empowering rural coastal community to rehabilitate and sustainably utilize and as well as conserve the mangrove and coastal resources, and that's why uh, these two organizations are now uh, working together to help the coastal resilience of the community, especially in the uh, in the project area in. The Mark and Pankup in South Sulawesi. And uh, this is also my colleague, Ratnawati, where she will also present uh, her part in the later slides. So uh, I will also like to throw an intriguing question about where does most of our seafood source from? Uh, is it from the sea or? Is it from the fish pond? Because uh, every time uh, we think about seafood, most of people will uh, like to imagine where the seafood comes from. And most of them will think it could be uh, from the fisheries or oceans or uh, uh, fish catch. But uh, is it true that most of the seafood we eat come from the sea? Because uh, as the data in this slide tells us, actually uh, total catch in fisheries are stagnant at, at around 19, 90 million tons. Uh, meanwhile, the aquaculture production has been uh, growing pretty fast uh, from 20 to 150 million tons between 1950 to 2018. This uh, staggering growth of aquaculture actually uh, shows us that uh, most of uh, seafood consumption, especially in Indonesia, are come from aquaculture in the fish ponds. Uh, not to mention that Indonesia is also the second largest seafood producer in the world after China. So uh, the the aquaculture production is uh, very uh, have a very large contribution to our economy. And relating this aquaculture to the mangrove forest, this is the global mangroves map. As you can see, there is a red 
red areas in this in this map, and most of the red areas is concentrated in Indonesia. And red area means the mangrove forest. And uh, it is known that Indonesia uh, is home to the world's largest mangrove area, where 20% of global mangrove is uh, located in this country. And not only about the mangrove itself, but it also reserves uh, one third of global fossil carbon stocks. Uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, despite this uh, huge amount of mangrove forests, uh, over at least over the last three decades, Indonesia has lost around 40% of its mangrove forests. And this rate actually uh, means that Indonesia is the has the fastest mangrove destruction among other countries in the world. And what uh, is the major uh, causes of this mangrove destruction? Uh, one of the largest challenge is the extensive development of aquaculture sector, because uh, millions hectares of mangrove, mangrove forests have been converted into uh, fish ponds. And as you can see in the picture, this is the typical fish ponds in the coastal areas in Indonesia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the practice of aquaculture isn't really sustainable. This is the picture of a, a, a regency, a region, namely the Mak in Indonesia. It is located in Central Java province, where it has a hefty contribution of aquaculture production. This is a picture of uh, coastal areas that formerly uh, covered with, with mangrove forests but then uh, it was converted into fish ponds. The, the lines, the yeah, uh, rectangle lines you see here, uh, actually the, the fish ponds embankments, but they, they, all, they, are, they are all fluted right now because uh, abrasion, coastal fluid, racing sea surface, and this, uh, these are largely because lack of knowledge about how to uh, conserve the mangrove and how to uh, balancing the fish pond creation with the uh, mangrove cons conservation. So uh, I was talking about the aquaculture consumption. Uh, in Indonesia alone, actually back in 2011, the consumption was uh, pretty stable at 29 kilograms per year per capita. But then eight years later, he, the number has doubled to 51 kilograms per year per capita. This is also uh, drive, driven by the the growing population, as well as the growing economy, uh, where the the middle class, you know, middle class group are raising, so they can consume more and they can afford more seafood for their daily intake. And with this uh, situation, uh, the question remains where we can find sustainable aquaculture or can we uh, uh, can can we just create an or empower the coastal communities to to have a more sustainable practice so uh, this is the map of indonesia and these uh, two regions Actually, uh, the location of, of the coastal heat school project 
implemented by Blue Forest. The first in in the Pangkep, so Sulawesi, and the second is in the Mac Central Java. Both both region are have a reach of mangrove forests, and that's why uh, the coastal fit school located in these two. And what is actually CFS or coastal field school? Uh, basically, the framework of this CFS is adopted from FFS or former field school. Uh, we approach the coastal communities and uh, encourage encourage them to identify the problem they face and how to address them using their own resources. Uh, their own resources uh, means that the local resource that they can afford and they can easily attain around their area. And one CFS uh, lasts for one farming cycle where we help them uh, to to have a more sustainable practice since the beginning or since the preparation of the farming cycle until the harvesting until the harvesting of the aquaculture they have and normally the meeting range from 12 up to 16 meetings and a more detail about these uh, CFS program will be delivered by my colleague Pratna uh, later on. So, uh, what is CFS actually? What what kind of framework does this uh, this method use? The first is uh, before we decide which uh, location of CFS. We will uh, assess the location and have feasibility studies. The studies is not only examining the examining the uh, mangrove condition or biophysical condition in this area, but also assess the farmers farmers willingness the fish farmers uh, willingness to learn new method or Will they uh, can they commit fully uh, to participate the whole CFS program? Because uh, actually, at some cases, not every not every fish farmer communities are eager to learn about uh, about new method on sustainable aquaculture practice because uh, they just uh, like to have the business as usual. So. Uh, it is uh, very important in feasibility studies to identify whether the fish farmer communities are willing to learn or willing to adopt the CFS program or not. And after we identify the location, the next thing is uh, intensive residential training for the facilitators. Uh, it is also important to have a facilitator that could uh, live in with the local communities because uh, social bonding is very crucial to, to influence the farmers to participate the whole activities. Like uh, if the farmers don't know or don't really know the facilitator personally and don't have that kind of uh, uh, frequent social interaction, the farmers will tend to, to you know, uh, kind of uh, not fully participate or hold and listen what the facilitator say. So uh, this is uh, important to have a facilitator that willing to uh, have like a residential training for a couple months prior to the CFS program. And next is identifying needs, uh, targeting and recruiting the participants. And we also provide a learning contract with the farmers to ensure their commitment. 
of n. The next is we want to equal, we want to uh, have equal participation of women and men. And based on the project in the Pankup and the map, it was recorded that around 51% of the participants were women. So the, the gap between <clears throat> men and women isn't uh, isn't really high, just a uh, 1% gap. And among those participants, we are getting that 75 or participants come from poor or vulnerable group, like, uh, like a widow or poor farmers or uh, the kind of fish farmers that uh, need that needs help to implement their aquaculture practice and to measure the knowledge improvement among the CFS participants uh, we also conduct pre and post tests to know uh, whether they their knowledge has been improved or not and the last thing is the farmers will present their learnings and findings to, to their peers. It's like a small uh, group meetings or small workshop where the farmers can finally learn and share their knowledge. This are, these three are the main subjects delivered in the CFS. Basically, it contains of Sustainable Livelihood Assessment, or SLA, and Aquaculture Production. And it also covers special topics that tailor to the local condition in the area, uh, such as uh, gender understanding, or uh, soil ecology, or organic fish feed. And more detail about these three, uh, will be uh, explained later on. And after uh, listening about the CFS framework and subjects delivered in the CFS, of course, the next question is, did the CFS actually work? And uh, how, does, how did it bring positive impact to these farmers and mangroves? So, uh, CFS in practice, uh, well, actually, this part will be delivered by my colleague, Ratna, because uh, she will present about uh, how the CFS uh, was going. Actually, this is the picture of women farmers that participate the CFS, the CFS program, where they have to identify their problems and solution related to the, the fish pond they have. So, um, Ratna, are you there yet? I, I don't see that she has entered the meeting yet, Ika. Oh, she's not in the meeting yet. Okay. I don't believe so. Uh, okay, then I'll just go ahead with the, the presentation. So, uh, yeah, uh, this is the CFS in practice. And yeah, as mentioned before, the challenge is to increase the sustainability of aquaculture. This picture shows an, an mangrove conversion that yeah, it's been severely converted into, into fish ponds. Uh, currently between 600,000 to 1 million hectares of mangrove forests have been converted. And uh, 
actually this is the old map uh, like maps from uh, 100 years ago because uh, this is old map of the fish pond fish pond in this area uh, it is one i just want to show that this practice ha have been there since uh, 100 years ago like uh, yeah it's been bef uh, uh, it's been long 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 practice and that's why it is hard to change the community behavior since they already learn about this since uh, 100 years ago uh, this also uh, the the uh, the fish pond areas where they've been converted and uh, actually the aquaculture expansion in several regions in Indonesia have been almost nearly reached the limit especially you can see in the map the limit uh, the mangrove cover loss is like 92% uh, and the South Sulawesi also uh, almost 90 hours almost 90% so this is a very alarming rate of uh, aquaculture expansion so uh, this is the picture of uh, training in creating the fish fertilizer, organic fish fertilizer. Uh, the picture above where, where the women farmers are protesting of the high, high containment of, of uh, pesticide that is not that is not environmental friendly. Hello, uh, Mbak Eka. Hello? Yeah. Uh, Karatna, are you there? Yes. Okay. Okay. So please, please go ahead with this presentation and I will uh, no. operate this slide for you. Welcome, okay, Ratna. Uh, yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry for uh, delay for uh, join about technical. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, uh, I will uh, continue. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, I explain about uh, the mark. Yes, uh, the mark is uh, Central Japa uh, landscape. There are uh, there are 13,000 hectares of mangrove growing here. So uh, more than 90% have been converted into corn. Yeah, this, uh, uh, so uh, one map uh, before uh, saw that pond uh, exists uh, in the map about uh, since 1892 or more than 130 years ago so yes i mean uh, the the maps so that the map in the map pond have exist since 1892 or more than 130 years ago that mean the pond is very old so uh, what about the current condition there? So the current condition, the pond is uh, area is very scary, where abrasion, sea water floods, decrease the uh, water quality, virus attack, and uh, decrease pond stream uh, milkfish death. So. Uh, Even two sub-villages in Bedono, villages have some, 
So this is the South Sulawesi. Uh, not much different from the map. South Sulawesi is uh, known as one of the pond center of Indonesia. In 1970, South Sulawesi had 214,000 hectares mangrove. But 10 years ago, it 1990 left only 20,000 hectares of mangrove. And more than 80% convert to ponds. This is pond uh, is Kurichaji, South Sulawesi. Uh, so uh, its uh, produce is very uh, low. So uh, Blue Forest has conducted research in 12 provinces in Indonesia that develop ponds. And all locations show a decrease in production. The reason are virus attack like a white spot, a fibrio, and increased use of chemical fertilizer and pesticide. So uh, we uh, believe that there are close relationship between mangrove loss and decrease in pond productivity. So according to the result of a research from uh, Georgian Primavera in Philippines, uh, she said that losing more than 12, uh, sorry, 20% of mangrove, so losing more than 20% of mangrove will cause ecological collapse or mangrove will lose their ecological function. So losing more than 20% of mangrove will cross the threshold where mangrove will lose their environmental services. So we know mangrove produce a biogenic or a nutrient producer with become food for shrimp and other living things there. So we can imagine if mangrove loss more than 90%. So Primavera suggests that if we want to develop pond in mangrove area, the ratio between mangrove and pond not more than 20%. Next, Matt. Yeah, so uh, the challenge now are how to prevent coastal area from losing more than 20% of mangroves. Yeah, next. So uh, this is uh, two, uh, I mean, uh, there are two sustainable aspect that recommended to manage a pond. A first intensification system and uh, the second uh, sustainable manage. So this is uh, the slide. We can uh, saw the one recommended like silver fisheries. So silver fisheries, uh, we plant a mangrove inside the pond, but uh, the fact in the uh, field, if we plant mangrove inside the pond, so uh, the leaf not uh, not can uh, decompose. So uh, the leaf uh, will uh, produce the nitrate. So uh, Nitrate is very uh, poison to shrimp. Okay, next. So uh, this is uh, the the mud uh, area. So in our uh, project in building with nature program, uh, the red part previously the pond. But the farmer move 
the embankment further back 20 meters. So the goal is to grow mangrove in area of 20 meters at the front. So the mangrove can be camped and filtered. So if mangrove in front of pond, mangrove can give ecological function compare mangrove planting inside the pond. Okay, next. So uh, how about the empowerment uh, of, of fish farmer? Because they are key to sustainable pond management. The approach applied uh, by Blue Forest is to combine the field school approach with LESA. LESA is Low External Input Sustainable Agriculture. In 1980, in the aquaculture sector, the term blue, blue revolution. Uh, we know uh, blue revolution which encouraged increased production of fishery products by using fertilizer, feed, and chemical pesticide. So uh, at the beginning, this uh, effort, uh, there was an increase in production, but then uh, excessive use of fertilizer and pesticide reduced pond production and caused dependence to chemical industry. So uh, the coastal field school approach is different from the normative extension model. Previously, the extension worker came with a fertilizer and a pesticide, and uh, which were given free to charge to fish farmer. But it was like uh, selling a drug, which uh, made a further addicted. So for a coastal field school, Thinking patterns in uh, CFS guide, uh, guides uh, participate in learning process with farmer to build critical thinking power and make farmer expert in their own land and not depend on outside parties. So uh, next. So, the educational foundation uh, used in a coastal field school is based on the learning cycle found uh, by Daniel uh, Kolb. Next. Which start from direct experience uh, or concrete experiment, then farmer see the uh, observe uh, what happened in the pond and there is a process and reflection where that is seen experience and draw conclusion. So the uh, meeting in uh, coastal field school is uh, complete, uh, complete about uh, 16 uh, meeting for a month for a one cycle uh, cultivate uh, Stream. So uh, at the beginning of coastal field school, farmer conduct us next. So the first uh, farmer uh, conduct sustainable uh, livelihood assessment to understand the condition of natural uh, resources, analysis of change. Uh, in their uh, resources, seasonal calendar, analyze of family needs, and all data and information result from a sustainable livelihood assessment, and then analyze and then decide to conduct a CFS of PON. So uh, after that, the next uh, CFS process is carry out pot uh, cultivation, uh, starting from pond planning, uh, such treatment uh, 
organic system between uh, chemical fertilizer how much stocking density and the basic principle of pond ecology is to reduce input from outside and improve the quality of the uh, input so we replace urea with the organic fertilizer like uh, made from uh, waste agriculture waste of uh, host hog uh, like the uh, leaves a uh, straw manure like that so uh, in the implementation of coastal field school, there are several things that must be considered. Uh, the first, like uh, we have a curriculum and we have a comparative participatory experiment. So we compare the cultivation method uh, traditional and uh, version traditional version farmer with the technology we want to introduce so uh, the cfs is set, uh, similar to student uh, research on campus so uh, uh, the third cfs uh, farmer also learn to monitor agro ecosystem for the sample monitor the water quality in a simple way uh, like uh, they uh, use the refractometer and CCDs to measure the turbid turbidity of pond water. So farmer use water turbidity data as basis for adding uh, how many uh, organic fertilizer uh, she must add. So uh, the four. Uh, we implement the low external input sustainable agriculture so uh, like that so the process is very complete uh, uh, we uh, make a meeting every week one a week uh, as long as uh, four months so for uh, now to impact the coastal field schools so we make a evaluation so uh, we evaluate the critical thinking of the fish farmer uh, and we uh, learn about the the agro ecosystem uh, analysis data for now the condition of the uh, pond like that so uh, laser application is uh, improve the yield and efficiency of fish pond farming uh, in study area so uh, fish farmer are also talk to uh, understand the rule of the mangrove and other vegetation in relation to her and uh, their ponds. The existence of mangrove uh, as a buffer, there are other plants that uh, can be used as fertilizer. So farmers uh, are also taught how to interact with the surrounding uh, environment. And the ultimate uh, goal is to limit the expansion of the pond. So that the pond doesn't expand, but can carry out smart and environmental friendly practice. So uh, the most important, the farmer uh, now interact uh, relationship between the agro ecosystem with the uh, fish or the stream. Uh, maybe uh, that is my presentation. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ratna.
that was excellent. Uh, sorry to my video camera. I'm now the, the new host because Brianna had to go and uh, okay. take care of her kids. Uh, Ika, do you still have uh, more to present on today? Um, not, not anymore. I think that's all of the presentation. Excellent. Then, uh, then we can open this up to questions for from if anyone here has any particular questions you'd like to ask Ratna or Ika. Um, I know I have one question to follow up, uh, Ratna, after your your presentation. I wanted to know um, more about uh, kind of the the challenges of getting to get uh, farmers involved into the program. Has it been a particularly difficult to get these uh, get people to want to help when profits are potentially at stake for them? Yeah, for uh, the uh, first, we uh, make a socialization in the field and uh, describe uh, what will we do in the coastal field school. Uh, and we make a contract uh, in uh, early uh, with them and uh, describe, we will learn about the, the uh, problem in uh, their pond. So now the fish farmer, like uh, they don't know what uh, they want to have to do because uh, if they uh, add the dose of vertical fertilizer, uh, semical fertilizer, so uh, the milk fish and the shrimp is uh, dead. So uh, usually they uh, anticipate uh, to uh, join the coastal field school. So coastal field school is a complete uh, learning because uh, uh, we conduct a 16 uh, meeting in uh, four months. So we learn uh, more all about the uh, pond. Like the most important, they they uh, understand the connection uh, between the uh, agro ecosystem uh, condition with the uh, pond, with the with their uh, milk fish or the tree. So usually we we uh, make a contract in uh, early meeting. Next. Understood. Okay, so they're, they're, they see it beneficial is that you guys can potentially help with the keeping ponds and things healthy for them so that they can continue to utilize them. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, because, if anyone else has uh, any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat here. Obviously, we know it's late for you too, so we don't wanna keep you up very late either. <laughs> All right, if, if nobody has any questions, I'm sure we don't want to keep our, our colleagues up at any later than they have to stay. Um, so uh, if you'd like to stay on here, we can discuss it. Otherwise, we, uh, we can end the, the meeting here uh, now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ika. Thank you, Ratna, for coming. Please, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye.